According to the IRS, how's that for a sermon opener? (laughs) Welcome to Mountain View. Let's talk taxes. According to the IRS, you need to keep your records and your receipts for at least three years after you've filed your taxes. Uh, This is not a tax talk. It's not even a money talk. It's just this one was free for you. But we were going through our garage uh, recently and pulled out uh, all of those old receipts from the manila envelopes that we, we keep them in, that we store them in. And pulling out all those old receipts brought back so many memories. We found receipts from Disneyland when we spent $65 on four churros. We didn't actually spend, I think it was like four for 99 bucks or something. I don't remember. Some kind of California resident deal. We we pulled out receipts from fun travel vacations that we'd had. We pulled out a receipt from CVS that just kept going and going. It was as tall as I am. We pulled out all these receipts that brought back so many memories for us. And if you went back in your own life, if uh, if you went back in your own story, if you went back in your own family Uh, personally, and pulled up some receipts that would likely bring back some memories. If you uh, pulled up receipts of past family vacations, time that you spent with your family, where memories were made, adventures were had, and meals were eaten out together, but they were shared together. Maybe, uh, Maybe you've pulled back some receipts in your mind from different times where you showed up in urgent care and got your kids first cast or pulled up receipts where you had to get stitches or staples or whatever the newest technology is. Maybe maybe you didn't go back personally or financially, but maybe you'd go back mentally and emotionally to uh, different times when you've struggled, uh, different moments where you've experienced disappointment, moments in your life where emotionally and mentally you're pulling up uh, figurative receipts in your mind and in your heart that Uh, that bring back memories of heartbreak and disappointment. And we keep receipts of people who've hurt us, who've harmed us, who've let us down, who've uh, just kind of left us hanging and left us feeling abandoned. That's kind of the way that we operate, isn't it? But if there's one thing that separates Jesus from the rest of all other religions, if there's If there's one thing that distinguishes Scripture and the gospel from every other world religion, it's this simple truth that because of Jesus, God keeps no receipts, which is good news for us. It's kind of how Paul says at the beginning of the chapter that we've been walking through over the past month. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ. We tend to think that God operates a little bit differently than that, right? We tend to hear a verse and a passage like, there is therefore now no condemnation. And and we think, oh, that's good news, but I just don't think it's good news for me because I'm not sure that that's the way that God operates. Because if we're being honest, it's it's not really the way that, that we operate, is it? We hold on to past hurts. We hold on to past uh, moments of disappointment and While we can't remember where we put our phone or where we put our keys, we can absolutely tell you what our spouse did or what our spouse said at 1143 on Tuesday, July the 11th in 2007 that made us frustrated or made us mad because we keep receipts. Or maybe you have people in your family, your close circle of friends and influence that they keep receipts. And every time you're together, They bring up what's happened in the past as if they can't seem to forget that at all. But somebody needs to be reminded today, right now, wherever you're at, wherever you've been, uh, whatever's happened in your life, wherever, wherever you've experienced disappointment and pain in the past, wherever you're at because of Jesus, God keeps no receipts. Because Paul says there is therefore now, right now, not at some point in history, uh, not, at, uh, not at just a biblical point in history, not at some point in the future will God show up and there will be no more condemnation. No, Paul says there is therefore now, right now, no condemnation. We could put a period there. We could end the story there, but Paul goes on. Paul 
It goes further to unpack and apply and talk about all of the practical implications of that very simple truth in our everyday life. Because Jesus didn't just come to change our eternity. Jesus came to change the here and the now. And the way that God changes our present, as we've seen all throughout Romans chapter 8, the way that God changes our present is by giving us his spirit that lives within us. Not, not lives within us to kind of keep us in check and make sure that we stay in line, but a spirit that lives within us not to, to bring fear that there's someone always watching, always watching you. No, because we, we saw last week that fear isn't in the spirit's toolbox, God didn't give us the spirit to keep us in line. God gave us the spirit to draw us into his family. Because of course we've messed up. Of course we're broken. Yes, we've made mistakes. Sin is a real thing. Not some spiritual idea that religious people came up with to control us. But Jesus on the cross took all of our self-centered, rebellious parts of our heart and our life. Jesus took the generation after generation, the, the, the long-standing history of brokenness in our life, and the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that we just sang about that we said, resurrection power lives in my veins too. Because now, we are no longer condemned. We can experience life right now because God loves you. But to take it a step further, God not only loves us, because we can kind of get sideways, we can get stuck in a rut thinking, yeah, God, of course, has to love us. But the reality of the gospel is that God loves us and he likes us. God likes you because you're a child of God, not a slave of God. And Paul picks up, we're about midway through Romans chapter 8. Paul picks up in verse 16 and says this, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This is great because we've got an inheritance from the creator of heaven and earth. This is great news. Paul sets the stage that if we're children, then we're heirs. There's an inheritance coming, but then there's a comma. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, Paul says, we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul throws a bit of a curveball here, like, what's the need, Paul, for the Jesus juke? Why, why would you have to say that? Why couldn't you just leave it at the good part? Why couldn't we just sit in this truth that we have an inheritance from our heavenly father? No, Paul says, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Why would Paul bring that up? Why? Everything up until now has been up and to the right. The bell curve has been up and to the right, but now Paul talks about suffering. Why would he do that? Because Paul knows that the reality is, even though we love Jesus, even though we've trusted Jesus and are following Jesus, even though we spend time in Scripture and pray with our families, even though we show up to church and we maybe even give to the local church, even though we've trusted Jesus, life still comes with struggles. Am I the only one? Even though we seem to be doing the right thing, headed in the right direction, praying to our heavenly father, life still can be hard. There are still difficulties. There's still heartbreak. It doesn't just magically, mystically, spiritually disappear when we say yes to Jesus, does it? Now, the reality is, if we don't consciously process our stories, we'll unconsciously project our sorrows into everyone around us. But the reality is, and Paul is going to set up and establish this tension for us in the text this morning, we live as followers of Jesus. We live in the already but not yet. Jesus has already changed us from the inside out, and yet there's a not yet aspect of the kingdom of God that, that we can't experience everything that Jesus has yet here on this earth. It's this tension in, in the in-between of the already and the not yet. It's already here, but there's yet more to come, which then leads us to a deep paradox of Christianity. This is the question that I get more often than any other question. If God is so good, 
then why is life so hard? The question can be asked in a multitude of ways. If God is so good, why do we still experience hard times? If God is so good, then why is there war in the Middle East and in the Ukraine? If God is so good, why does do why some families still struggle with infertility and miscarriage? If God is so good, then why is there racism and injustice and prejudice and abuse? If God is so good, why, why is my family facing tough financial pressure every time we go to the grocery store? If God is so good, then why can't I find just the basics of a good job? If God's so good, why do hurricanes and natural disasters happen and destroy homes and, and destroy lives? How do we deal with all of this? Like, how do we navigate the realities and the complexities of suffering in the world around us? How do we make sense of it? Paul goes on in verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Notice that Paul doesn't say, hey, just hunker down a little bit. Just kind of get through it. Huddle up a little bit with other Christians. Make sure that you're going to church. Just spend time with other believers so that you can talk the same language. No, Paul doesn't say that at all. Paul doesn't say, hey, make sure that you know some things. Make sure that you memorize some verses. Make sure that you can know where to turn in Scripture when you're going through that difficult time. No, Paul doesn't say, just pray about it and it'll go away. Paul doesn't even say anything cliche, let go and let God. Paul doesn't say, ah, you're depressed again. It must be revealing an area you don't trust God. No, Paul doesn't say you must not be going to church enough. Paul does say the pain that we experience in the present cannot compare to the glory that is to come. Paul shifts and shapes our perspective and he doesn't say, hey, what you're experiencing today is it's just not important. Paul doesn't minimize what we're going through and, and, and say, you know, that's not real, that's not genuine. He doesn't say you should ignore it and just smile and say God's good any, anyway. No, Paul doesn't provide any of these culturally acceptable yet biblically unacceptable platitudes that church people provide. We've just got to understand, Paul is helping to shape for us that what we're going through does not compare to what, where we're going to. Now, you may have been a Christian for decades. Maybe you're here today because you heard you could dress up in your favorite Halloween costume and get a bowl of chili. Uh, wherever you're at today, the, the great equalizer for all of us, whether you're following Jesus or not, is suffering. And we all have questions about suffering. Like, why does God allow certain things to happen? Like, how do I get through the, the junk in my life? Like, why do I always think the thoughts that I do? Why can't I have solid and healthy relationships? Why is my family always dysfunctional? Why can't I get out of debt? Questions that I've even had myself. I, I grew up and I was, I was always the skinny kid growing up in elementary and middle school and and in high school, and uh, that kind of positioned and postured me uh, in a unique way to get picked on a bit, to get even bullied at times. And there was always this kid who, from elementary all the way through high school, we went to school together, and this was the kid who was taller and stronger and more athletic, and like he was shaven by the third grade, and so he just, he was always picking on me. And I was the kid in, in, in high school, I, I didn't make the baseball team, I got cut. Uh, I, I wasn't the kid that was picked for uh, kickball. There are still moments today, and I've done uh, extensive work with my therapist, with my soul care coach, that I can still get sideways because I get stuck in my head. There's still moments that I grapple and wrestle with insecurities in my own life and in my own heart. And so I have these questions probably like you do. And what does Paul say in verse 18? He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Verse 19, for the creation, for all of us, the creation waits with eager longing 
for the revealing of the sons of God. Paul shares, I believe in this text, in these two verses, two of the most important words in ministry. Me too. When you talk about suffering, yeah, I've, I've been there. When you talk about difficulty and, and hardship, yeah, me too. In fact, all of creation, Paul says, we're all in this suffering together, probably you too. But the gospel says that the hope, the gospel is this, the hope of God through Jesus played out in the lives of real people like me and you. Paul doesn't discount anything that we're going through. He doesn't gloss over it. He doesn't say, you know what, that doesn't exist. That's just in your mind. No, what Paul does is he begins to put things into perspective for us. He says, our circumstances, our suffering will not outweigh what God has for us in eternity. When something tragic happens in our world, when we go to a funeral, when something bad happens, we have this temptation to placate the situation, like use Christian catchphrases, like, oh, well, everything happens for a reason. Can I just say that's nowhere in the Bible? Like, that's not a biblical uh, verse. The, the reason evil happens is because evil people do evil things. And sin has infected everything in our world. In the very beginning, God created everything, and everything was good with the caveat of cats. That, that was not God's idea. But everything that God created was good. But then Paul says, and he's talking about creation and how things began to go sideways. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin entered and, and Paul says that it spread to, to, to all things. Sin tainted and broke all things. Essentially, in a phrase, sin is all-encompassing and far-reaching. It's this theological, biblical idea known as the fall. When sin entered, everything fell apart. And sin broke things to the point that there is, to this day, thousands of years later, because of sin, there is suffering. There is evil. There's war, there is racism and homicide. The Germans torpedoed the Lusitania cruise ship that killed thousands of British citizens, that sparked the United States getting involved in World War I and multitudes of people dying. That's evil in our world. That's sin and the impact of sin in our world. September 11th. There were people who flew airplanes into a building full of women and children and men and over 3,000 children lost their parents on September 11th. That is evil in our world. And then there are also choices that human beings make, choices that bring pain and suffering like the chain smoker who has five packs of cigarettes a day cannot say, you know what, I just got cancer because of sin in the world. No, that's a conscious choice that that person made. But then there are moments too, maybe moments that you've experienced, the moments that I, I look at the suffering in the world, the, the pain, moments like infertility, moments when a dream of pregnancy ends in stillbirth, moments of a cancer diagnosis, moments when tragedy strikes in an automobile accident. And the question is asked, why did that happen? And the only answer that I have in moments like that is, I, I don't know. But Paul reminds us that because of Jesus, the evil all of the wrong, all of the heartbreak, because of Jesus, all of the loss and all of the diagnosis and all of the disease, because of Jesus, natural disasters and homicide and racism, because of Jesus, evil in the world does not get the final say. In a few verses, Paul declares that we're gonna look at it in a few weeks, but in a few verses after this, as he's talking about suffering, Paul declares that God is working. Not that God might work, no, God is working. Not that God could if he chose to. Not that uh, we think or we suspect that God may do something here. 
Not that God will work if you work. Not that God will step in if you pick things up and you polish things up and that you pony up in certain ways. No, Paul says in just a few verses, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. God works all things, not just the spiritual things, not just the biblical things, not just the religious things. God works all things, not just the healthy and the happy things and the, uh, the, the things that are right and the things that are in line with his call. No, God works all things for the good of those who love him, which means if it's not good, God is not done. It may not be good for you now. It may not be good for you tomorrow. I'm not saying that it'll be absolutely, completely good for you on this side of heaven. But what Paul reminds us in this text is while it may not be good on this side, it's not done because this life isn't all there is. In a sense, suffering is temporary. Listen, we may suffer our entire life But in Christ, suffering is still temporary because of what God promises in eternity. Paul says, almost like this kid on Christmas Day who, if you've got young kids that they're excited about Christmas Day, come five o'clock in the morning, they're knocking on your door ready to open presents. It's 5 a.m., go back to sleep. Like a kid peering over the edge, looking and waiting and expecting something great on the other side. We're all waiting, Paul says an eager expectation of the new that God has, the new that is without death and decay and disease and difficulty. Paul goes on, verse 20, for creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory, of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Creation, Paul says, is not only waiting, but we're groaning. Like deep down in our bones, we know that this isn't the way that life ought to be. This isn't the way that things ought to go. Like the innocent lives shouldn't be lost in war and terrorism, but they are. This is the groaning Paul is talking about. It's, it's this groaning that people shouldn't be brutally murdered when they go on an evening jog, but, but they are. It's this groaning of the financial difficulties of inflation and debt and despair, and yet it's a reality. People who say just a couple of sentences on social media who are totally and completely ostracized because of what they said in a post on social media. This shouldn't happen, Paul says, but all of us are groaning like in childbirth. Careful, Paul. Like you're a single guy. You've never given birth to a child. Easy, Paul. Like don't say it's kind of like kidney stones. I've had kidney stones. It's bad. It's like childbirth. No, don't do that, Paul. Careful, you're single. But what Paul is saying is that there, there's pain, there's groaning, but even in labor pains, there's new life and new joy and new hope. We, we talk about this a lot here at Mountain View, that, that hope is less something in our hearts and more so something we hold on to in our hands. The biblical word in the Old Testament for hope is actually the same word that's used for a rope. That hope is something we can actually tangibly, really hold on to in the deepest and darkest and uh, moments in our life when we're ready to give up. Suffering, Paul shows us in this text, is not God's invention. Suffering is because of sin. But what he does say is that, that present pain can't compare to future glory. So, what do we do in the midst of suffering? Well, on your way out this morning, we're going to give you a, a button that you can push when you suffer, and it'll just eject you from whatever the suffering is. 
I'm kidding, we don't have any buttons. We have snow globes that when you're suffering and struggling, you just shake it up a little bit and it'll, it'll change all of your... Sur- no, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, we have essential oils so that when you're suffering and you're struggling, you can just put a little dab on and it'll take... No, it's not that easy, is it? I wish we could push a button, shake a snow globe, grab some oils. It's not as easy as me saying that it's all gonna work out because I don't know that it will this side of eternity. But I can tell you with confidence that it will work out eventually. That's where we place our hope. We don't put our hope in us. We don't put our hope in our circumstances. We put our hope in our Savior. He is the rope of hope that we hold on to. Having hope doesn't always remove the hurt, but it does give us something to hold on to. Paul talks about that hope in verse 24. For in this hope, we are saved how are we saved? Jesus. For in this hope, for in Jesus, we're saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. We, as followers of Jesus, have been made alive. We've gone from death to life. And that's the hope of what we have. That that we look forward to that we hold on to, that hope in the midst of suffering and struggling that we hold on to. It's a hope that Paul talks about in Colossians chapter one. Verse 27, Paul says this, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, this mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, your hope of glory. Not Christ for you, not Christ given to you. Christ, Paul says, in you. He says it a little bit differently. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, when Paul writes this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of of his glory, this hope that's in us is guaranteed, sealed by the Holy Spirit in us, which means that what we go through, what we struggle with, we are not alone in our struggles and in our suffering. And we hold on to this hope because what is to come is something greater than we've ever experienced. Our hope is not Just get through it. Just get through whatever. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Just get through whatever it is and that you're going through in life. No, our hope isn't we're gonna grow in the midst of all this struggle. All of this is true. Our our hope isn't that we're gonna live to be 85, 95, 105 years old. Our hope is let's not make a lot, let's make a lot of money. Our, Our hope isn't in prosperity. It's not in our political agenda. The hope is that Jesus is in us and that nothing we experience here on earth will stop what Jesus has for us in eternity. That's hope that Jesus overcame death and the power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in us who are in Christ. You and I are resurrection people. So as we experience the struggles of life, as we experience the death of relationships, the difficulties of finances, the the loss of dreams, the hardships of relationships and business, as we experience the death of things that we wish were gonna come true, we have a greater hope because we are resurrection people, people that have the fresh spirit of God breathing on us, breathing on those dry bones of everything in our life that comes back to life. But in order for us to experience our resurrection, we first got to experience death. If you've ever planted anything in your life, seeds in your garden, you may know this from like third or fourth grade science, the process of germination. When you plant a seed in soil, it nestles into the soil and undergoes this transformation. But before the seed germinates and turns into a plant, that seed has to die first. And through this cycle, that single seed that dies yields so much more than it ever could 
in its dormant state. It breaks through the soil. It bears fruit and generates countless new seeds, each seed brimming with the potential for life. Before we experience a resurrection, often we must first experience a death. In 1834, Edward Mote, a cabinet maker, wrote a song that still stands the test of time today, a hundred years later, the song on Christ the Solid Rock that says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the overwhelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock we stand. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that in the difficulties of our life, in the struggles that we face, in the suffering that we walk through, we're grateful that you're with us, that you're for us, and that whatever we walk through, whatever we go through, whatever we carry, whatever struggles we face, we can know that they're temporary. Not temporary in a sense that you're going to take them away because you haven't promised that life would be easy, but you have promised that our life could be spent with you in eternity. So this morning, God, would you remind us of the hope that we hold on to, the hope that we have that's found in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.